Hello, everyone, and thank you. I'm going to talk today about healing and caring in virtual worlds. I'll be talking about my own experience of working with patients in the NHS, and I'll tell you about how I started using it in my own practice and how that's led from my surgery in Eastbourne by an NHS hacking event to an intensive care unit in London and on to collaborating with a Kiwi in Norway. But first, a little bit more about me. My name is Dr. Keith Grimes. I'm a GP and I work in a walk-in centre in Eastbourne. I've worked as a GP for 16 years, mainly in urgent care, and I see a huge variety of patients every day of the week. I'm also a geek and a gamer, and in truth, I'm probably more of the latter than the former. I've certainly been geeking and gaming for longer than I've been a doctor, and as a result of this, I've spent my entire career trying to bring together medicine, technology, and gaming. It's never been easy, but lately there's been more of an interest in the area. So I now like to think of myself as a digital healthcare innovator, combining the three. Whilst I've had success with a number of different technological innovations, VR is somewhat new territory for the NHS. So what role is there for VR in healing and caring? Today, I will argue that VR has an important role in medicine right now and will have an increasingly important role in the future. I believe that virtual reality can make existing treatment more effective and tolerable, that it is a novel therapeutic modality, but it's also a novel diagnostic tool. I believe that VR can improve education and training for patients and doctors. And I also believe that VR can increase empathy and break down barriers. All of this was theoretically possible with VR the first time around in the 90s. However, now I believe that the technology is good enough to deliver on this promise. What's more, the technology is widely available, relatively cheap and increasingly in common ownership. And this allows for experimentation. And this is where my story really starts. <clears throat> I'd like to tell you about one of my patients. Let's call him Adam. Adam is one of my favorite patients. He's in his 50s, he loves rugby, and he's built like a prop forward. And that's handy because he was one, semi-professional, many years. And as a result, most of our consultations involved talking about rugby and the fights he got into. Now he's retired now, and amongst his health problems are leg ulcers. Leg ulcers are wounds which take time to heal and require frequent dressings. These dressings can be painful, and between talking about rugby, he would often become tearful at the level of pain he was experiencing during these dressings. Pain that we couldn't control with normal painkillers. And one day he asked me directly, if only there was something that could distract me from the pain, Doc. Pictured on the right is my Gear VR headset, which I'd recently acquired. And you can probably guess where this is going. First, let's talk about pain. Hands up anyone who's ever experienced pain. Of course, that's everyone. We've all had pain at some point in our life. Some of us may even be in pain right now, hopefully not as a result of the talk. And whilst you're all probably well acquainted with pain, it's worthwhile looking at the definition. Here is one taken from the International Association for the Study of Pain. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with the actual or potential tissue damage, or described in terms of such damage. From this, you can see that pain has three main components. One, the physical, the actual tissue damage or signals transferred via nerves to the spinal cord, up through the brainstem and into the brain itself. Two, the emotional, how we feel has a tremendous effect on how we perceive pain. And this cuts both ways. And thirdly, cognitive, the way we think and understand what these sensations mean. All three components have a tremendous effect on how painful something is. Now, you're all probably well aware of how we manage pain too, uh, by using drugs like painkillers, devices such as cold packs and TENS machines, and also psychological methods such as distraction and mindfulness. What about VR? Well, it turns out that all three components of pain, physical, emotional, and cognitive, can be affected by virtual reality. 
pain is a complex physiological response and managing it is not perfectly understood. And there are good theoretical grounds for how pain can be managed without drugs. To start with, there is gait theory. First proposed by Mel Zuck and Wall in 1965, this states that pain signals traveling from the tissue to the spinal cord can be interrupted or modulated by competing signals coming into the same area of the spine or above or below. This is why when you hurt something, you can reduce the pain by rubbing the area or applying hot or cold to the area. Next, we have McCall and Mallow's 1984 finding that humans have a limited capacity for the attention to pain. This is sometimes called the spotlight theory, and it states that there's only a certain amount of processing power that the human mind can expend on attention to pain. Divert the attention elsewhere, and you perceive less pain. And this is why your toothache is worse at night. There's less to distract you. Another finding was that of multiple resource theory, proposed by Wickens, also in 1984. This states that attention isn't just one processor, but multiple processors with different functions. By making demands across different processors, you can disrupt focus or attention on painful stimuli. So this, combined with gait theory and the limited capacity for attention to pain, is thought to be part of why VR works to relieve pain. Now there is evidence of this too. A small, case study, a small case study by Hoffman back in 1996 of two Burns patients showed that there was significant reduction in the perception of pain using virtual reality during dressing changes. And there's been a study after study building on this, with Hoffman developing a game called Snow World back in 2003. In this virtual reality game, users would throw snowballs at snowmen and penguins, and it was found to be remarkably effective at reducing pain. More recently, DeepStream VR produced Cool, where this little guy on the right helps carefully distract and focus a patient with acute or chronic pain. This too appears to be even more effective. So, getting back to my practice now, I don't have Cool or Snow World, I just have my Gear VR and phone. Now I knew a little bit about VR and pain control, and I was fascinated by the potential. And one day, Mary came to see me. Now this isn't a picture of Mary here, but picture her. Mary is a lady in her thirties and she'd just given birth. She was troubled by a pilonidal abscess, which for those that don't know, is a skin infection you get at the bottom of your back. It requires surgical treatment, but afterwards it needs a period of daily dressings by packing the wound with material. Yes, it is as painful as it sounds and it's difficult to control that pain. What's more, Mary was breastfeeding so it was even harder to find something to help that would be passed on through the breast milk. She came to me because she was really struggling. She was also really anxious and upset by these dressings and fearful of having a definitive operation to fix it because she'd need to have even more dressings. Now at this point I had a choice and because I'm equal parts geek, gamer and doctor, I felt that VR was worth trying. So I, I discussed it with Mary. I explained what I knew about it and what I thought the potential pros and cons were. And to Mary's credit, she decided to give it a go. And on the 9th of May 2016, I got to use VR to reduce pain for real with a patient. And the question you'll be asking is, did it work? Well, of course it worked. I mean, I wouldn't be standing here giving this presentation if it didn't. The quote at the top is from Mary at the end of the week. I'd used off the shelf content in Gear VR. So on day one, we used a application called Introduction to VR from the o Oculus Store. Over the course of the week, she also watched the Cirque du Soleil and some 360 YouTube content and more. And she reported between 50 and 90% reduction in her pain as measured using a visual analog scale. What's more, she had a significant reduction in her anxiety when she was having the dressings. On more than one occasion, she didn't even realize that we'd finished doing the dressing. And you know, the nurses were impressed too. They were freed up from having to rush through the procedure, all the while having to distract the patient as well. And the patient has also now consented to having a definitive operation to fix this, because she knows she can use VR in the future. Now, for a first attempt, that's pretty impressive, no? 
I've since embarked on using VR in my practice in many more patients. I've used it for wound care, like with Mary. I've tried it when into undertaking incision and drainage on patients with treating infections like boils. We've even tried it for joint injections, tissue swelling, and blood tests. Now, I'm no fan of having my blood tested, and that on the top right is me having my blood taken. And what I found with patients and myself is that it remains pretty effective, but those high anxiety or fearful procedures, they're the ones that tend to benefit the most. I've also found that gamers are particularly susceptible to the effect. For example, one man in his 20s, again with a pyelonidal abscess, would scream the place down during his daily dressings. But yet, when I gave him Eve Gunjack to play, he was focused, he was calm, and crucially, much less sweary. Evidence shows that the more senses you recruit using VR, such as sight, sound, motion, intent, and focus, the greater the level of pain relief. So, what next? Emboldened by my experience on acute pain, I started to listen to my patients to see what else I could help with. I have two patients with amputations, and they suffer from a form of pain called phantom limb pain. And it turns out that VR can help there too. Phantom limb pain is pain experienced in a missing body part, such as an amputated hand or foot. And it's pretty common. It affects up to 70% of patients who've had an amputation. Now, with over 11 million amputees globally, that's a significant number, number of people with phantom pain. What's more, this number is growing thanks to diseases like diabetes. It's also very difficult to control with conventional medicines, and that's definitely true of my two patients. So, what about VR? Well, one of the first uses of VR for pain was for phantom limb pain. Ramachandran used mirrors to affect a crude form of physical virtual reality back in 1996. And he found that amputees could achieve pain relief by putting a mirror between the two limbs to give the illusion that their missing limb was intact again. Now, this has since been replicated in VR. And the reasons for how this work, again, are poorly understood, but it's thought to work by reintegrating the mental body image that becomes broken after amputation. VR is also better than mirrors because you can use muscle sensors to simulate the actual movement of the limb, which increases pain relief. VR also allows people with bilateral amputations to uh, achieve pain relief. Now again, I don't have access to this service for my patients on the NHS just yet, so I resorted to what I knew best. In this case, it was going to an NHS hack day and hacking a solution. And here you can see the team that I formed on the day. From the left, we have Becky, Reno, Ali, me, and then on the right, Helen. Over the 36 hours, we experimented with using different forms of VR and 360 to see what might be practically possible to replicate mirror therapy. We tried using Unity to build virtual limbs. We tried distraction. There on the left, that's Reno, and that's with his hand in a bucket of ice water. We tried using 360 video, both straight, mirrored, and live stream. Becky's demonstrating with the, gorilla, uh, the duct tape gorilla pod method just on her chest right there. And then what we found was that even crude VR and 360, using off-the-shelf components, could deliver good pain relief And when we simulated using a cold presser challenge, which is what that ice bucket is. We posted it all on virtualanalgesia.net, and if my workload ever lets up for more than a few minutes, I'll be taking everything I learned at this event to share with my two patients. Now, as I've used VR with my patients, I've been sharing what I've been doing at talks like Health 2.0 and on my Facebook group, VR Doctors. It was through this that things started to get more serious and large scale. I was approached by Mr. Sunil Boudia at Harefield Hospital in London. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon who does heart operations and transplants. Now he'd seen my talk and he wondered whether VR could be used to prevent post-operative delirium. Now, you not, may not know much about that, but it is an important problem. Post-operative delirium is essentially confusion agitation or drowsiness that happens during recovery from a general anesthetic. It affects between 14 and 24% of adult hospital admissions and up to 83% of critically ill patients. And it's especially pronounced in patients that end up in intensive care units or ICU. And these are the sort of patients that Mr. Boudia deals with. Postoperative delirium is dangerous because patients require closer monitoring and sedation. They may hurt themselves when they're agitated. It could lead to delayed recovery, 
further harm, or in some cases, even death. The causes are complex, but they include physical factors like age, chronic disease, medication, and infection. And whilst medication can help treat it, the best methods of management appear to be prevention, preoperative optimization, making sure a patient is well for the operation, orientating them early on the ward, and mobilizing them early. Now, what Mr. Boudia was wondering was whether a patient could be pre-experienced to waking up in intensive care. So when they came around from anesthetic in ICU for the first time, it wasn't so unfamiliar. So think of it a little bit like that first night on holiday when you've traveled a long way and you wake up in a strange room. That's pretty confusing the first time round, isn't it? Now, imagine the same thing, but this time you're in pain. You're battling an infection, you're full of hospital grade drugs, and you have someone else's heart and lungs inside your chest. From this idea and treating it, we've discovered, developed Recover. Recover stands for Resilience in Intensive Care Units Using Virtual Reality. Yeah, I'm pretty proud of that one. Uh, we're working on using 4K 360 video to record the patient pathway on the way to theater. We're capturing the ward, the trip to pre-op, pre -op, anesthetic room, operating theater, recovery, and then the intensive care unit. Now this video will have hotspots to allow patients to look at what equipment they will see on their journey and to hear a voiceover explaining what it is. We plan to use this with patients at the preoperative seminar, which they can then take home. And our hope is that by spending time in VR, they'll become familiar with the places they'll be during their operation and in recovery. In turn, we hope this might reduce post-operative delirium and maybe even post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, I haven't said much about PTSD. Suffice to say that ICU can be a pretty traumatic place and it can take a long time to recover from the mental effects. Should we be successful on a small cohort, the hope is that we can deliver this at a larger scale in a randomized controlled trial for patients across the Northwest London Critical Care Network. From what I've said so far, it might seem that VR is a pretty safe and simple intervention. Well, that's maybe not entirely the case. As with anything in medicine, we must first do no harm, and VR is no exception. Some of the potential harms of using VR will be well known to you all. For a start, there are some contraindications, photosensitive epilepsy and severe balance disorders. We're also not quite sure about how VR might be used in dementia, in patients who are actively delirious or psychotic. But even here, it may have a rule, role that is worth exploring. Then there's simulation sickness. And this can be managed by using careful UI design and high quality equipment. But there is a group of patients that may never tolerate VR in its current form. Ab reaction describes the adverse reaction to so someone might have when they're immersed in a VR scene that triggers unpleasant memories. PTSD in combat, for example. But actually, this is a feature of why VR could be useful in treating PTSD. For example, in the work that Skip Rizzo has undertaken with veterans using a program called Brave Mind. Then there's the more practical stuff. Yeah, you need to be able to clean the headsets between uses, make sure people aren't tripping over or falling over. And finally, ethical and moral considerations. How do you make this accessible to everyone that needs it? Is VR effective enough to be used at a cost that will work an increasingly cash-strapped NHS? Bearing all of this in mind, we come to the practical considerations, which can help determine how VR might succeed in healthcare. While I've had some success with off-the-shelf content, the evidence points towards the importance of a personalized virtual environment being a factor in VR being effective treatment. As you all know, that personalization can be time-consuming and can be costly. This is partly why 360 video is popular. It's quick, cheap, and can achieve pretty good results. But we aspire to better. So how do we create personalized environments? One way might be through collaborative creation, where the patient and the clinician work together within VR to shape a therapeutic environment. And we might use a social space like Altspace VR. I've already used this with my colleagues on VR Doctors Group to explore what it's like to consult in virtual reality. Maybe we can use VR Minecraft. Using the crafting tools in there, I've been able to build bridges over long drops, which we could then use to help treat a patient with a fear of heights, maybe, to reduce their phobias. And then there's Tilt Brush. By simply creating in VR, opens up whole new therapeutic areas. 
All of these things are adaptations of existing apps, all with their own limitations. And personally, I'd like to see the creation of a clinical virtual environment construction platform with simple tools to allow patients and clinicians to create the healing virtual spaces themselves. I'd like to end with some speculation. I've learned from my experience of using VR with my patients, but I've also met people like Shafi Ahmed, who's working on using VR to globalize surgical training by streaming operations in Live360. I've explored collaborative VR spaces with academics like Simon McCallum, the Norwegian Kiwi I mentioned earlier on. And I met him at Games for Health in Utrecht last month. And today I've heard from people like Emily Tullach talking about the use of virtual reality for mental health care with Mindwave. From all of this, I think that VR, as well as augmented reality, have great potential for health and social care. I foresee a time when consultations can happen in VR, AR, or even mixed reality, where the doctor and patient appear in personalized virtual environments to suit their clinical needs. Medical information can be shared in whatever form works best, be that images, animations, 3D models, or even activities. As VR appears to have multiple uses, Patients might be prescribed several VR ingredients as part of a compounded therapy. And because it all occurs in VR, both patient and doctor will be able to revisit their consultation afterwards as often as they wish. And not only to see it again, but maybe see it from a different angle or change any or all the elements to suit their needs. Maybe there's natural language assistants like Amazon Echo and Google Home that we're all beginning to see in our homes. Maybe they'll take a physical form in VR space and act as a personal assistant and advocate at every part of our health and care journey. The possibilities of virtual reality really are potentially endless. The question is what aspects of VR are helpful now and how can we all work together to explore the rest? And with that, I'll finish with a call for fellow explorers. I'm happy to connect on Twitter or via my blog, and you're all very welcome to join the Facebook group VR Doctors. And if you happen to have a painful wound that needs dressing, and you're in Eastbourne Station, you could always take a chance and pop in, as I might actually be working. And maybe we can try it all out together. Thank you.